Most medications on the market actually offer a fairly modest benefit, and often come with a long list of side effects, yet there is one drug that is readily available and offers the following list of benefits. It increases your lifespan, increases your quality of life, reduces your risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, improves your mood, can be used to treat depression, and best of all, it has barely any side effects, and it's absolutely free. Well, you've probably heard this fairly glib comparison before, because of course the drug in question is exercise. But I think it is a useful way to truly illustrate how important exercise is. Along with the food you put in your body, there's nothing with a greater impact on your health. Aside from maybe choosing what DNA to inherit, which I trust you all did in between incarnations. What's that? Ah, sorry, that appears to be only in the Hindu and Buddhist expansion pack. Okay, so you already know that going to the gym makes you fitter, but how does it do this? Obviously the cardiovascular benefit comes from posing in the mirror, with the weight loss clearly occurring when you post that sexy gym selfie on your Insta stories. That's just science, but how much do you really know about what's taking place inside the body during that 5% of your gym session when you're actually working out? Heart rate goes up, you get a bit out of breath, but what else? Millions of years of evolution have produced an incredibly sophisticated process with a multitude of changes that we'll take a look at today, and also what happens when those changes go wrong. We refer to having an impaired heart as heart failure, a term that sometimes comes with emotional baggage or implies the wrong thing. The British Society for Heart Failure are kind of riffing on this with their Freedom From Failure F-word campaign, not just challenging how we think of failure, but also helping educate about the symptoms of heart failure, namely fluid buildup fatigue, and fighting for breath. To find out more about exercise in the heart, I went to my old stomping ground of Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, site of many national, European, and world transplant firsts, and the biggest heart transplant centre in the UK, to meet some of my friends in the transplant team. Oh, hold on, I filmed this a little while ago, and I don't want to have any continuity errors. Patients whose hearts are severely impaired are referred to Papworth to see whether they are suitable for a heart transplant. They undergo various tests, including a cardiopulmonary exercise test, or CPET. One such patient is Dale, who very kindly allowed me to film his CPET. Steve Pettit is one of the consultant cardiologists here in Papworth Hospital, and my ex-boss, who's very kindly organised, along with his team, for us to see a couple of specialised tests today. We're going to start with something called a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Steve, uh, what are the kinds of uh, reasons that somebody would have a CPET test? We can do cardiopulmonary exercise testing for a, for a few different reasons. Sometimes we do it uh, to try and figure out why it is that a particular patient is breathless when they exert themselves, whether it's to do with a, a problem with the heart or a problem with the lungs or, or, or a problem somewhere else in the body. So you can, you can use it to try and figure out which organ system is to blame for a, for a patient's breathlessness. But the, but the main reason we're doing it today is, is different. Um, we're doing it to try and see uh, exactly what a patient who we know has got heart failure is capable of doing to try and uh, determine what their peak exercise performance is because that's a really powerful marker of prognosis. It's a really powerful marker of, of how that person will do in the weeks and the months that, and the years that follow. And so it helps us when we're thinking about whether certain types of treatment, like having a heart transplant, would, would, would be worthwhile. The reason VO2 max is one of the numbers we pay particular attention to in heart failure is because it has a strong prognostic value. A VO2 max of greater than 20 translates as only a 5% one-year mortality but a VO2 max of less than 14 predicts an 80% one-year mortality. So I guess I could put simply, uh, during a CPET, you're measuring the amount of oxygenosis in uh, <laughs> The toss-up we had was either film indoors, where we all have to be masked, or come outdoors, where we're in the middle of a huge building site, uh, which is the biomedical campus in Cambridge, where there's all kinds of stuff happening. Yeah, so I guess simply we're measuring how much oxygen is going into the person, uh, how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the person as they exercise. When the person reaches their, you know, th their limit, we're able to calculate something called the PVO2, which is a measure of essentially how much oxygen can they get from the environment and turn into work, turn into energy. And, and PVO2 is a really powerful marker of prognosis in, in patients with heart failure. So, so you or me, I'd maybe expect us to have a peak VO2 of somewhere between 30, 35, 40. Um, you know, people who are really elite athletes, maybe they'd have a peak VO2 of 50 or 60, some of the sort of fittest ever human beings, 80 or 90. But for patients with heart failure, we're looking for people with a peak VO2 less than 12 to 14, depending if they're beta blocked. If it's lower than that, then they're running into trouble. And, and we need to think about that. 
A bit of trivia I found quite cool when I used to supervise these very transplant assessments is that patients are told to avoid fizzy drinks, because the machine measures the amount of carbon dioxide someone produces as a surrogate for how hard their body is working, as it's the byproduct of respiration, and if you have a stomach full of carbonated drink releasing carbon dioxide, it completely invalidates the measurement. So I, I know my peak VO2. I, I tested it many years ago when I was much fitter, and I refused to recheck it <laughs> because it will only have gone down. Uh, but it was it was 48, 48? In, in Cambridge okay. uh, years ago. That is good going. But how about the athletes of the animal kingdom? So sort of what numbers would we get for them? So there are there are husky sled dogs that have been uh, have their PVO2s measured when they're working hard. They get a PVO2 of around about 150. Yeah. Um, and apparently thoroughbred horses up to 190. So yeah, humans have got nothing humans to be proud are about. Humans pathetic. <laughs> In cardiology, we tend to do most of our tests with the patient at rest, which is easier, but not that useful because most of our patients get symptoms when they exert themselves. By measuring heart rate and rhythm, blood pressure, the amount of oxygen going in and carbon dioxide coming out, a mass of information can be derived right down to the cellular level about what's happening in the patient's body. Later in the video, we'll take a look at an exercise ultrasound of the heart as well, but you can also do invasive tests like right or left heart catheterization, where you have tubes actually inside the heart while someone is exercising, like this one performed at my current hospital. Man walks into a bar and says, I'll have a pint of adenosine triphosphate. And the barman says, sure, that'll be ATP. <laughs> adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is the principal energy source for muscular contraction. Energy supplies to muscle are initially provided from the immediate energy sources of ATP and phosphocreatine before other aspects of metabolism are activated, like the breakdown of glycogen, glucose, and fat. Ventilation, the volume of gas you breathe in and out, can increase from about 4 to 6 litres per minute at rest to over 100 litres per minute as you breathe faster and deeper. Whether you're testing someone with a failing heart or an elite athlete, you can assess whether the exercise test is truly diagnostic by seeing if they cross something called the anaerobic threshold, sometimes described as the maximal lactate steady state. In fact, athletes will sometimes aim to train just above the AT, as this can benefit both anaerobic and aerobic fitness. The AT is the level above which pyruvate, which is a breakdown product of anaerobic metabolism, is produced faster than it can be used aerobically. Pyruvate breaks down into lactic acid and hydrogen ions, and you'll remember that pH is a measure of H plus hydrogen concentration, so this results in acidosis in the tissues, and that is the burn that personal trainers like to torture you with. Next up, I spoke to Dr. Lynn Williams about exercise echocardiography. This is an ultrasound scan of the heart taken whilst exercising. Right, so this is our exercise echo room, and we have this specially designed exercise bike, which allows us to simultaneously have patients performing exercise, but also facilitates imaging throughout the test. By actually recreating their symptoms, we can actually assess what's going on in the heart. Now, what we typically do is take a set of resting images, which we're doing at the moment, and the things we're focusing in on are cardiac function at rest, we're looking at the cardiac output, so we're measuring the stroke volume, as well as recording the resting heart rate. We can also measure the pulmonary artery pressure. Again, you can scan someone's heart at rest. It can look quite normal, even if they have severe cardiac impairment, which is why exercise tests are so useful. What the exercise echo adds to the CPET is to do things like non-invasively measure pressure inside the vessels and cardiac chambers using some very clever physics, but also actually visualize the changes occurring with the pumping function of the heart to explain why the person might be breathless. For example, if there is a narrowing in a coronary artery, meaning that the amount of blood can't be increased when the patient's exercising, then that region of muscle that it supplies might not move properly. Then some people have a small stiff heart, meaning that their heart cannot expand larger than a baseline for the filling part of the cardiac cycle, which is called diastole, and they can't accommodate more blood, even though the squeezing part is fine. Then other people have a kind of large baggy heart, where the problem is not getting enough blood in, but not being able to squeeze enough blood out. They're unable to increase the percentage pushed out with each beat in the squeezing portion of the cardiac cycle, which is called systole. In a healthy heart, you will see heart rate go up along with the stroke volume. This is the volume of blood ejected with each beat and being able to 
increase your stroke volume adequately relies on expanding your heart in diastole to get lots of blood in, then squeezing it small in systole, ejecting lots of blood out. What sort of increase in cardiac output would you expect with exercise? Uh, so it, it often depends on the fitness and the heart rate response to exercise. <laughs> so we can see patients, um, some, some young fit patients, almost uh, triple their cardiac output. The heart rate multiplied by stroke volume gives you a figure called cardiac output. At rest, cardiac output is typically about 4 litres a minute. In a fit person, it can go up to 10 or 15 litres a minute, but in some elite athletes, it can exceed even 40 litres a minute. Yeah, so our stroke volume has gone up to 91 mils, and we can see our cardiac output has more than doubled now to 9.2 mils. So presumably uh, you know, elderly patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction are less able to mount this sort of increase in stroke volume in response to exercise. Yes. And often you find that they have a more hypertensive response to exercise, so the afterload also impedes that contractile reserve of the ventricle. The left ventricular cavity is emptying because the heart is more dynamic. And again, we're at a heart rate now of 104. So that's so far, it seems like the majority of the increase in cardiac output is reflected by changes in Heart rate. Heart rate. A slightly lesser amount yeah. of changes in stroke volume. And this is often in young fit people, low resting heart rate, very good heart rate re uh, response to exercise. In some of our elderly patients, the actual chronotrophic response to exercise is far more blunted and for them the stroke volume is very important. We're at 160 watts. Oh, we're doing well. He's doing very well. So we've been going 10 minutes, keeping up a speed of 60 RPM. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to put it into recovery. We can see that we've got a very quick heart rate recovery here. It's a sign of good cardiovascular fitness. And then typically in recovery, we're repeating all of our measures. We usually image for a few minutes. So you can see as the heart rates come down, the cardiac outputs come down yeah. quite quickly. These are just the immediate effects of exercise, but of course, the thing that makes it that wonder drug that I spoke of at the start of the video are the long-term effects it has on your body. And an important message I want to send is that exercise doesn't have to be triathlons or Ironman or women events or marathons. It can be walking the dog, dancing, yoga, kicking a ball around with your kids, just something that gets you a bit out of breath. You don't need to collapse in a sweaty heap attempting to do a bad impression of David Goggins. You're not David Goggins. Any exercise is better than no exercise. Don't be put off by the idea it has to be intense. So stop watching this and get out there. I mean, watch the sponsor bit first, obviously, so that I can exercise my ability to negotiate a higher rate and keep this channel going. Now, we've talked about people whose hearts are impaired, but these same tests, especially the CPET, are used in the training of elite athletes. To demonstrate this, I could have, of course, put myself forward to do a test, but I didn't want to alienate you viewers with my Olympic levels of fitness. And besides, you know, who would hold the camera? <laughs> so my old friend Steve, emphasis on the old, a mild-mannered consultant cardiologist, kindly volunteered. Now, surely he wouldn't best my VO2 max of 48 set when I was about 30 years old. Would he? So what, what's, uh, what's the magic number for Steve? Um, hang on. 60.9. 60.9. Really elite athletes, maybe that have beat go to 50 or 60, 50 or 60, 50 or 60, 50 or 60, 50 or 60. A huge thank you to everyone at Royal Papworth Hospital, especially Dale, who very kindly allowed his CPET to be filmed. Thank you also to the British Society for Heart Failure. To find out more about their campaign, please check out the links below. I've also launched a vaguely monthly newsletter, so please sign up 
also at a link below. That's one way to support me and the channel, but another is to give me an even better drug than exercise, dopamine, mainline it into my veins by pressing like and sharing this with an exercise fan. Now, two of the tissues intrinsically linked to exercise are bone and fat, and they're the subject of one episode of the brilliant The Body series on Curiosity Stream. Exercise directly impacts both of them, and new research is shedding light on how they in turn can affect health in ways we previously didn't appreciate. You can learn more about the signaling networks that I've kind of hinted at in this video and find out about really cutting edge research proposing how bone and fat might actually prevent disease. It's honestly a great series and I've learned a lot from it. Curiosity Stream has thousands more high quality mind expanding documentaries on science, medicine, history, the arts and loads more. And you can get access to all of them for only $15 or 10 quid. That's all for a whole year. That's 26% off the normal price because we're just wild like that. And what's more, you'll be able to get access to Nebula as well, included in that price, which is a streaming platform that I started along with some of your favorite independent educational creators. You'll find exclusive Nebula original series there, like Joe Scott's Hilarious, sometimes gross and always fascinating mysteries of the human body. Get access to both for a whole year for the price of a movie by visiting curiositystream.com forward slash medlife and using the code medlife. And after that, make sure you do something active today if you can. It doesn't have to be extravagant. Personally, I'm just going to be systematically abused by my kids, finding new and imaginative ways to inflict injury on my spine. And then I'll probably spend the rest of the day lying on the ground in agony. But, you know, maybe for you, just go for a little jog.